welcome everybody to this um, AMS webinar. We're very um, happy to be able to present this today, the webinar supporting changes to the ARC funding rules. And I will hand over now to Adrian to get us started. All right, welcome to this webinar. It's a part of uh, a series of webinars and events that ANS runs to support uh, institutions really as they come to terms with finding value in research data and uh, access to research data. This particular webinar is part of this a little sub-series that we're running around the recent uh, updates to the ARC uh, funding guideline because they have some ramifications for um, uh, research data. We're very, very lucky to have uh, some fantastic guests along today. We have uh, Professor Brian Yates, who's the uh, ARC Executive Director for Engineering, Maths and Information Sciences. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, we also have uh, Justin Withers, who's the uh, Manager of the Strategy Branch at the ARC. Welcome, Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Welcome, Justin. Thanks for coming on. We also have uh, Greg here. Greg Lachlan is the Principal Policy Advisor at ANS, and I'm uh, Adrian Burton, uh, one of the directors at uh, the Australian National Data Service. The, the plan of action for today is we'd like to hear, you know, what, exactly what these changes are. So let's get down to the, the facts, what they are. Um, so I think we've got a few slides from our guests at the uh, ARC. Um, then I think a, a little panel discussion about, you know, why the changes have happened, uh, you know, what what's the scope, or what does it mean, where does it fit in, into the whole system. We are going to take questions as well from uh, the audience. We have such a big audience today that it may be tricky for us to get to all the questions. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can during the session. Uh, keep putting all the questions in that you have because even if we can't cover them all, these questions are all captured as part of the presentation and we'll hand them across to our colleagues at the ARC. They can take that into account perhaps in their own sort of documentation as will Anne's. All right, so let's uh, cut over to um, Justin and uh, Brian for a, an overview of the changes. Okay, well, look, thanks very much, Adrian. It's, um, thanks for setting this up and inviting us to be part of it. The ARC has been thinking about data for some time and uh, with the support of ANS and a whole lot of other people uh, thinking about how better, I guess, to, to make use of, of the research data which is funded through, through public funding. And so this has all just sort of come together in a way that, um, that we've been able to sort of put some things into the funding rules this year. First of all, I should just say thank you to all of the people who are there uh, registered for this uh, webinar. It's fantastic to see so much interest and support from the community. Up first of all is just um, the bit of background. So we say there that the Australian Research Council is committed to maximising the benefits from ARC funded research, including through ensuring greater access to research data. Second dot point to continue to foster a culture of good data management and practices by both data generators and users, so, so the researchers and the use and other users, the latest version of the ARC funding rules and supporting documents now further clarify the ARC's data management expectations. Uh, some important things here to emphasise is that the ARC is not mandating open data. That's something we really want to emphasise, that this discussion we're having includes open data, certainly, um, thinking about what might happen that way, but it is not, the ARC is not mandating that all data generated as part of research projects should, should be made open. We're asking instead for you to, to talk about um, what are your plans. So we say there the ARC is encouraging the researchers to consider the ways in which they can best manage, store, disseminate and reuse data generated through ARC funded research. A brief outline uh, of the management of data is now required as part of the project description. And this approach, we hope, will enable researchers to take into account differences that may exist between institutions, disciplines and research projects. And so I guess what we mean by that is that we realise is one size won't fit everyone, one size won't fit all the different uh, differences between disciplines. So it's really important that this is a discipline based understanding of management of research data um, and, and so that's why we're trying to acknowledge the differences there between disciplines and also as we say between institutions and, and research projects. So uh, at the heart of it 
uh, other funding rules for our funding schemes. So on this slide, we've got the discovery program funding rules. And the bit that's highlighted there is uh, the ARC, or sorry, I should say before the highlighted bit, we refer to the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research. And that in turn talks about the responsible management of, of data that's generated as part of a, um, a research. So we say the ARC considers data management planning an important part of the responsible conduct of research and strongly encourages the deposit of data arising from the project in an appropriate, sorry, publicly accessible subject and or institutional repository. So that's the, um, that's the funding rules there, which sort of set the, the scene for the way that you craft your uh, grant application. As all of you know, I think when you are applying for ARC funding, uh, there are several important documents. So one is the funding rules we've just talked about, and the other two are the instructions for applicants and the frequently asked questions. And both of those are sometimes used to perhaps clarify or give further instruction about um, what are our expectations. So let's look at the instructions for applicants, I think, next. So in the instructions to applicants uh, for the discovery project, we say there, we ask you to outline the plans for the management of data produced as a result of the proposed research, including but not limited to storage, access and reuse arrangements. And so this is coming in the discovery projects under part C, the project description. And I think it's the very last heading that we have there after you've done the aims and background and project and all those sorts of things. At the, at the last heading we have there is the management of data and that's our instruction. Let's go to the frequently asked questions. Don't need to remind you that these are all on the ARC's website. Uh, there's a, a web link there at the bottom of the page, but essentially if you go to arc.gov.au, you can find all of this information there. So this uh, frequently asked question here is saying, what information am I required to provide? So we emphasize again in our answer that the ARC does not mandate open data. However, researchers are encouraged to consider the ways in which they can best manage, store, disseminate and reuse the data generated. The project description requires researchers to articulate briefly their plans. And in answering this question, researchers need not include include extensive detail of the physical or technological infrastructure. Rather, answers should focus on plans to make data as openly accessible as possible uh, for the purposes of verification of the conduct of future research by others. And the, the last bit in this answer is important. Where it may not be appropriate for data to be disseminated or reused, justification may be, may be provided. So once again, we're really, it's really important to think about what's appropriate for your discipline in some disciplines, the data is made available almost as soon as it's collected. In other disciplines, uh, because of privacy or intellectual property reasons, it may well be appropriate uh, not to release the data for some years um, after it's been collected and uh, analysed and, and published. So it's really important to think about what's appropriate for your discipline. Um, just as a general comment, I would encourage all researchers to, to think about this as an opportunity for describing how data management will enhance the research outcomes of your of your project so don't think about it as a, a more as a compliance thing but more how can it be how can i use this to uh, show that in my discipline i'm really ahead of the game or i'm up with the game in terms of making my data available according to what's expected in my discipline think about it as a way that you can enhance the competitiveness of your grant application how will what I say in this section help my grant proposal to get over the line in terms of, of being recommended for funding. There's a question that, that I had one of the presentations I gave, which was, uh, is it sufficient just to know that I will comply with my institution's requirements? And the answer is no. While the institution will have very good plans often or very good templates for data management plans, what we're really asking here is what are your plans specific for the project which you just described in this in this section? What are you thinking about the research uh, data that's going to be generated as part of that um, specific project? So again, this is not an opportunity really for you to enhance the competitiveness of 
your specific research project in the way you, that you describe uh, what you're going to do with the research data. All right, so Justin, do you have any comments on what I've said so far? No, I think uh, throughout uh, our documentation and uh, whether it's the, the funding rules or the FAQs, um, it's very important to remember that uh, it's not a mandate. And it's all about tailoring your data management plans and considerations specific to your, your project and the type of data that may be generated from that research. Uh, we are very um, cognizant of the fact that different disciplines have uh, very different data types which are produced. So there is no one size that fits all. And we are encouraging greater recognition and uh, due consideration to, to data management, but that's about as far as we can go because uh, you can't fit the square peg in a round hole and there's very different types of data generated. Mm -hmm. So they're the changes. I'm just trying to think about the, you know, the audience we have here. Probably what they're thinking is, you know, what, uh, there's a new data management section that is new. What, what goes in there? Um, there's some good guidance there in the, um, you have the other frequently asked question where it says, don't worry too much about the technology and the, mm -hmm. the details of uh, the technical details of data management. Take it as an opportunity to focus on you know, how the data will be made openly accessible uh, for the purposes of verification and for the conduct, conduct of future research. So that sounds like a very you know, good focus, you know, particularly mm -hmm. I assume at the beginning you're not asking people to know everything about the project mm -hmm. and all their plans. Is that is that a... A fair comment? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think that we are trying to get a general description, a short, brief general mm -hmm. description, if that's appropriate, mm -hmm. uh, for your discipline on on what, what what you plan to do with the data. So I think in the instructions for applicants, again, we talk about the storage, access and reuse. So they're, they're sort of three key things, and, mm -hmm. but we do say, you know, including, so there mm -hmm. might be other things that you wish to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. But I think one could make fairly pithy statements about storage, access and reuse, mm. um, and, and that would be sort of sufficient. Again, that's my suggestion. Of course, applicants should think about what, what are the expectations in your discipline, and so what would make your proposal competitiveness, sorry, competitive in terms of how you describe this and how much information you put in there. Mm, you've made that clear in the second FAQ that it does need to be customised to this project, not yeah. about general matters. So a risk here would be that an information management specialist or an archivist would see in the same sentence, you know, outline your plans for data management and think, oh, I see a data management plan. And you haven't asked for it, so I'm just I'm actually trying to clarify here. Had you asked for a data management plan, you know, in our world that could be 10 pages, could yeah. be 15. In fact, it could be one of the main documents of, of any project. So I'm assuming, you know, obviously making it clear that we're not talking about a data management plan in that kind of a sense. No, I think it would be beneficial for um, the project to have a data management yeah. plan, but we're not asking for that to be That's presented not, in, our, in the application. Yeah. Yeah. A reference to the data management plan and, and the key points of what yeah, it may yeah, contain yeah. will suffice. Sure. But behind yeah. that, which yes. for the own use of the project and the institution involved, best practice would, would suggest that the data management plan would be very useful. And I think for people who are, you know, for, for whom this is new, I mean, there are, if I can um, just praise ANS a little bit, I mean, there are some really good support materials on the ANS website, including example data management plans, the, the sort of the 10 page option that, that Adrian's talking about. So that's a that's a good thing to sit behind the, the project, but that's not, we're not expecting a 10 page formal data management plan, mm -hmm. but just the synopsis. And as in most things, the earlier you start thinking about something, mm -hmm. the, the more opportunities you have to do it better. In the bad old days of information management, we would get finish a research project and then say, oh, where did I keep all that data yes. first thing? And then you know, what would happen to it? So I think it's a great thing to start, to prompt people to start thinking about that right from the beginning. There was a question there. Do you want to see the data management plan or the evidence of a data management plan? given space limitations and so on? Well, part of it's, again, thinking about what would an assessor want to see? So it's not really what the ARC wants to see, but what would make your proposal competitive uh, from an assessor point of view? And if I was an assessor, I would be trying to look for some of the details of what you're planning on doing, not the evidence that you already have a plan, but what what are, what is the plan? What, mm -hmm. what do you intend to do? How will you mm -hmm. share the data if that's what's expected in your discipline? I could think of some disciplines where if you were to say that I don't plan to share my data, then that would be looked upon in a negative context. If, if 
normally in that discipline data is made available? So I think the answer is yes. I think there would need to be some details about what you plan to do. And probably from a, you know, an archivist point of view, the, the focus that you've asked here on how to make things open and accessible might be, I don't know, let's just make up a term so it doesn't have any connotations. You know, a, a dissemination plan would be part of the, the statement here that we're talking about. That, um, you know, what are our plans for disseminating and sharing and making the thing mm -hmm. as accessible as possible? So the size, obviously, I mean, that's another thing that you know, we've had questions about size. Now, mm -hmm. I assume that goes back to choices made by the applicant. The, the full context for a project description, that's 10. 10 pages. Yes. Yeah. Well, let, let me give an, an answer to that. Yeah. I think when we asked people a year ago to talk about open access publications and so on, what, what were their plans that way? It was very interesting, I think, that, that that's been somewhat driven by the sector as well, so that the responses that we, we saw in applications tended to reflect what is the, the practice in, in the current discipline, best practice or otherwise, so that to, trying to talk about plans for, for um, publishing in an open access way. And I sort of anticipate the same sort of things will be here, that, that people may well just write a few sentences, a, you know, a short paragraph about what's expected or what, or what their mm -hmm. plans are, and I think that would be okay for most assessors. Mm -hmm. Um, there might be some disciplines or some applications where you feel it's more important, where, where data management's a key aspect of the proposal and you mm -hmm. may wish to actually address it in a more fulsome way. But so there's a, a general envelope and then, again, as in all these things, how much time do you allocate to each of the sections is yes. part yeah. of the art of putting it, submitting a good application. Then. So then what happens to the data management section? What will become of that, that information? How, how does it flow through the, the assessment life cycle? Yes, okay. yes. so a, a legitimate question is how does this play into the assessment process in terms of consideration by assessors and so on? So there are several criteria that we have, the selection criteria for assessing the, the research grants, and there's, there's not a specific criterion about data management. But there are a couple of criteria where, where I think that data management plays into that particular area. So um, this is about the research project and Justin's just going to remind me what those criteria are. Um, so under the research environment, for example, we ask, we, we talk there, you know, it's a very holistic sort of uh, criterion, but about the, the plans for dissemination and, uh, and so on of the outcomes and, and the research data. But also there's something under the feasibility and benefit criterion as well, where your plans for managing your data surely address some of the issues about feasibility and benefits of carrying out the research. So that I think that um, holistically, if I can use that word, uh, the management of data plays into a number of the selection criteria that are going to be used by the assessors. So the, correct me if I'm wrong, the plan itself doesn't get a mark, you know, this is the best plan we have or a good plan. However, the information that's that's in there is critical to an assessor being able to make a decision, let's say, about feasibility yes. and those things. Yes, I mean, this this um, section C of the discovery project application form, a lot of the information that goes to address the these two selection criteria I mentioned come from that section in terms of the feasibility and benefit in the research environment. So that's where assessors will be, will be looking, part of their looking will be in those areas to, uh, to get that information of which the data management section will be part of that. Um, and again, if I can just comment, I think we, we did see comments from assessors last year about the open access publication right. aspects, which, which, which were in a similar way as mm -hmm. part of this section. And so assessors would read what applicants had written and take that into uh, as part of the overall judgment against the selection criterion Mm -hmm. and indeed make comments back to the applicants uh, sometimes about their, their plans for open access. Okay, so there can be a, a two-way thing here that says you've raised this in your data management yes. section, mm -hmm. clarification or perhaps you could improve that there are suggestions that come back. Is that right? Yes, yeah. yes, we, we don't give people a chance to, to well we do get yeah. them through the rejoinder but mm -hmm. they don't get a chance to actually improve their application mm -hmm. except in the following round of course, mm -hmm. but, um, but certainly there may be comments from assessors about that mm -hmm. they it might be a very good plan you know it's highly mm -hmm. it's very much at the forefront of what's expected or it might be that there are some mm -hmm. uh, things that they expected should be there that weren't that's the feedback yeah and then perhaps this is looking into the future are there reporting requirements around this particular area or that's general reporting requirements for the 
dissemination of data? Um, do you draw a line between the plan, let's say, and the, the reporting at the end, or we haven't addressed that yet? Is that... So my, my thinking on that line is that uh, we don't, at this stage, have a formal requirement um, mm -hmm. in, our, in our reporting for, for data management. We, we, have, we certainly ask for, mm. for what's happened with, with the data and publications and things like that. So that um, I could imagine that that we, you know we we may look to saying more along those lines. Mm -hmm. My other comments would be that as part of the progress reports and so on that we we request as part of the grant application process, that in subsequent years there may well be an expectation that people will mention something about their data mm -hmm. um, as part of that. When I say there may be an expectation, I'm not suggesting the ARC is going to ask that, but mm -hmm. it may be that assessors expect something or that or that a proposal again is more competitive if it mm. says something about mm. what they've done with their data management um, mm. from previously funded ARC projects. Yeah. The future builds on you know what we're doing yeah. now and, yeah. and having this kind of information and having it up front in people's minds uh, certainly builds a good foundation for future mm. grant applications. A question now about the funding rules. So what uh, you've made a statement in the funding rules about uh, there's an, uh, a renewed expectation, if you like, and, and pointing people back to the code and yeah. and then uh, strongly encouraging about depositing. And so uh, well, how does that work? What, what, the funding, what are the funding, the fact that that's in the funding rules, what are the ramifications? So, but I guess I should try to reassure people that in some way, in some sense, this is what we should have all been doing anyway. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's their part of the code of conduct. So in many ways, um, it, the, the framework is there for how we should be thinking about managing our data. If anything, I guess we're just nudging people a little bit to describe to us what, mm -hmm. they're, what they are doing with that. And yes, I guess nudging people a little bit towards thinking about how to make data more accessible so that other people can reuse the data and, and that we get the most value out of the data which has been generated as part of the ARC funded research. Yes, and, and I think, the, there are lots of, as you've said, for the integrity of science, the repl replication of, of research, for the reuse. But I suppose ARC has a special place in the research system in that you can look at the return on investment on the whole funding dollar, if you like, and say, well, by making these uh, recommendations and, and changes to the funding rules, we're getting a, a better return on investment because there's more efficient use of data or reuse from one project to the yes, next. Yes, yes, I think absolutely. So mm -hmm. I mean, I have to emphasize again that the ARC is not mandating open data at all, mm -hmm. but there is definitely current thinking you know, in the world towards moving towards where possible, making data uh, more accessible, more shareable, so that so that we do get better value for money. And it's a public investment in the research, and I guess there's a public expectation that the investment in the public funds should be to mm. outcomes which are publicly accessible. And as Brian said, it's uh, not just something the ARC is pushing for, it is uh, it's happening internationally. Um, we have had in place since 2007 the Code for Responsible Conduct of Research, which has specified uh, responsible ma data management. Uh, and as Brian said, we're just, uh, I guess, more clearly articulating the ARC's expectations uh, and linking whatever we're putting down here links back to that code to uh, undertake uh, research in a responsible manner, there should be due consideration given to the data managed, the data generated, and, and how it's made accessible. And it's a broader expectation in society. It's not something that just sits mm. in a research mm. bubble. Yes. Yeah, this is a new world that we live in with information flows being a lot easier, and yeah. so therefore greater expectations of, of access, and, mm. and there are machines that help us to do, to reuse these things. So it's a big tide that's swashing over, you know, education, media, journalism, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Mm. Uh, and this is the reflection, I suppose, within our world of a change in expectations, as you said, you know, from the disciplines themselves. But, you know, this is what great research is at the moment and this is how we can do new types of research. Well, that's, that's a really important point. I mean, I think as people start to think about this and embrace it, I'm sure that people will see a benefit for themselves as researchers from someone else's data being made at more available as well. So it should be a win-win situation in those disciplines where sharing of data is the appropriate thing to do. So I think we might go over to our questions. We've got quite a few here now. I'm going to apologise in advance that we may not get to them all. What sort of weighting does the data management information have? Currently there is no weighting assigned specifically to the data management plan. 
but as I said, it plays into several of the selection criteria. The information in the plan is the only way in which you can prove some of the criteria. Yes, yes. yes. Without what, the plan itself having a particular weight. Yes. Yeah, you can enhance your project description by um, um, providing an adequate description of the way you're going to manage the data. Another question we have, will you be giving assessors any instructions about data management in the assessors pack? Yes, we are. So we always have an assessor handbook, which is provided to the assessors electronically. And as part of that assessor handbook, we have been discussing how best to uh, describe the ARC's direction or in, in data management. Um, so there are some proposals to include some, some guidance there for assessors. Yeah, we had another related question there that was asking about the issue of the assessors diverse views uh, on, on data and whether they will all bring the same reaction, that they'll be as diverse as the applicants, I suppose. And, uh, exactly. And again, I think that that will certainly pick up discipline differences, Adrian, so that, oh, so yeah, that you know, okay. the, the, there will be assessors in, in one discipline who perhaps are strongly in favour of it, of whatever. I don't mean in favour of it, but, but supportive of the particular plan which has mm -hmm. been discussed, uh, whereas another discipline that might be inappropriate. I think, look, I think you're right. Assessors will have different views. Different assessors will have different views about the actual research project, and that will include mm -hmm. the, the plans for management of the data. Mm -hmm. And consistent, I suppose you're always balancing consistency with the sort of what the assessors as a group come up with. Well, the, the ARC strongly believes in peer assessment. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really crucial part of all that we do. So if, if someone's worried about what their peers are thinking, uh, that's that's a valid you know thing to be thinking about, but in the end, it's your peers that are assessing your your research project. I think I might just a comment I'd make is I think it's it's very appropriate, very targeted because the differences between disciplines are quite fundamental. In some disciplines, um, they survive by sharing data, and mm. others, some of the primary data doesn't make a great deal of sense without the context. So I think having a discipline focus, I, I really believe that is a good. Good message. So we have a question that might actually be related. The ARC in 2013 mandated publications being deposited in a repository. Why didn't you mandate that data be deposited in the same or similar repositories? We, we, have, uh, done thought we, have, thought we have thought about it, um, but I guess it comes back to the fact that the data generated uh, across disciplines is very, very different. Uh, and it's very, very difficult for um, us to mandate how that data should be stored uh, in common ways when the data can be so different in the type and also the size. So whilst on paper it seems quite a simple concept that we can mandate the, the publications be made open access after a 12-month period, uh, when you look at it in a bit more detail when it comes to data generated, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. So at the moment, as far as we are prepared to go, is to um, encourage that the applicants and the institutions give discipline-specific, project-specific considerations to the way in which they're going to manage the data that they generate. And there is mention of highly encouraging depositing in publicly accessible repositories, yes. 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 Um, and I suppose that goes back to your point about this is not a mandate, so that's yes. it's different. I suppose there, there is a real reason, you know, that a publication is a public thing. It's inherently public and they're all the same. You know, they're all text-based, you know, journals, 99% yeah. the same. Um, and so, therefore, a, a blanket policy seems to cover that space quite nicely. I suppose you, you, the principle people are asking here, you know, this is also publicly funded, so why is it not, you know, mandated to be publicly deposited? I think that's because the things we're talking about here are, are quite heterogeneous. They're not all PDFs and, yeah. and websites from nature. They are lots of different things, and some of them have been created to be made public. Some of them have been created not to be made public. And so therefore, just taking that blanket view would not have been a positive first step. You know, there, there's so much difference there. How would you make a rule that says mm. everything has to be? You know, there already you just come up with five big exceptions to that rule. Well, then you know, it's no, no longer a, a blanket mandate. I mean, it's not. Some public publishers are, uh, are now actually requiring that the data behind the uh, uh, published art, journal article is required to be made public as well. So, mm -hmm. um, it's not just a push from government. Uh, mm -hmm. There is an expectation from across the sector, from uh, the publishing area as well, that the publication produced from research can be supported with the data uh, as mm -hmm. well. PLOS One is one that I'm aware of most recently uh, that have required that the data behind a, a, an article 
um, needs to be able to be provided as well. So there's a direct line of sight between a research output in the form of the publication and the data supporting it. And when it comes to the data generated from a research project, there may be a whole bulk sets of data that aren't actually haven't been utilised yet uh, for a publisher. So very difficult to, to mandate that yeah. all data generated should should be made. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. What exactly do the panel mean by making data more accessible? Is it actual access or through dissemination or are we the panel or is it the assessment panel? Well, that's, that's <laughs> actually a good yeah, point yeah. because in the end it's, it's the panel of assessors or the, the external assessors that you have for each application and then the panel uh, from the College of Experts. Uh, it's it's what's what's expected there, so that your assessors in your discipline may well expect a certain thing in terms of accessibility, um, actually being able to um, make the the data available through some repository, or it might be that the data needs to be disseminated in some way. So it's really again a very discipline specific answer. But I think at the very least, the the data should be made accessible, as, as in, in a repository. As as in repositories, if someone's looking mm. for it, they can find it. Um, yeah. I don't think. At this stage, there's an expectation from us that you uh, actively disseminate the data that's generated, um, but there needs to be reference points to enable people to locate their data it's the and strategy. access it if need. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. And there is a growing infrastructure of repositories and registries where these things can be deposited and registered yeah. as a public item, and then you know, discovery and that active publication. Again, it's, it's a slightly different world from you know, journal publication. So. I think it's from this uh, a follow up there. What about confidential confidentiality and such issues? Well, I have to say that's an easy one to answer uh, because we are asking the applicants to describe what are their plans for data management. And if it's um, not appropriate for the data to be disseminated, then uh, we, we would expect you to, to say that and provide a brief justification. In one sense, it's a great that's a good thing about basing all of this all on the code. Yeah. Code says as part of your research, you need to be, you know, you need to respect confidentiality and you know, all those things. So in one sense, your data management plan, if there is confidentiality involved, it you know, needs to address that, saying, yes, we're going to be proactive in the way in which we respect you know, the privacy of people, uh, as well as you know, balancing any data sharing uh, aspirations. Another question. It seems like they are using data management as if it means data dissemination. Can we get their definition of data management? Yes. Okay. So I think I would go back to saying storage, access, and reuse. So, so you're right. Maybe in our discussion, maybe we have been just focusing on access recently, but um, but it is about storage and reuse as well. Mm -hmm. So it's storage, access, and reuse. You have to be careful. I mean, that's that we're suggesting that it include those items. Yeah, it might right. include other aspects as well mm -hmm. of managing the data. And the, uh, with the FAQ kind of focus that says we're not necessarily talking about the store, you know, all the technology behind the storage and uh, yeah. the technical yeah. details of format migration and no, no, no. curation, yeah. etc. at this point. But what you can be sure about is my intention to you know, deposit or publish yeah. or share in a particular community. We move on. Yep. There's the next question. Is it appropriate to add any data management related costs, storage, curation, etc.? to the project budget. That's so my, my thoughts would be that, uh, so we do allow people to specify publication costs. So any of our costs that, allow, that are allowed in our budget table as part of the proposal have to be well justified and have to be well justified, not just in terms of this is a, you know, a competitive cost by market standards, but more why is this cost required for this particular research to be carried mm -hmm. out? How, how will this cost uh, this budget item enhance the research. So that's what I would say to this uh, question is that yes, I can't think off the top of my head why we, we wouldn't be allowed to be specified, but it would need to be well justified as to why this is important to enhance the research outcomes. It kind of underlines the fact tangentially there that we talk a lot about data reuse and you know, public dissemination, etc. There is a good deal of data management practice that really just reaps benefits to the project itself. So in order to do really good research right. in lots of fields, you need to have be right on top of the, uh, the data during the project itself. Otherwise, you won't have the world's best research. You won't have, uh, uh, and having done all that for perhaps for, you know, 
egoistic reasons, there are some altruistic you know, yes. benefits that, uh, that can be added on there. So, you know, in, in one sense, these costs are required in order to do excellent research. And having done excellent research, we'll be in a very good position, you know, with a thorough handle on the data for that, you know, second phase of data sharing and data dissemination. All right, another question. If you fail to follow your data management plan and therefore are in breach of your ARC award, what happens? Well, it's interesting. I, I'm Again, I think I'm going to answer it not from a compliance legalistic point of view. I think we have seen, again, with, with um, open access publication, a sector-driven response to, to that um, or request or suggestion for requiring open access publication. So it's really the sector itself has, has responded, the assessors have responded, saying, well, look, I don't really think that the, the, what this person plans to do is really sufficient in terms of making um, uh, their publications accessible or whatever, or so, something like that. And mm -hmm. I could imagine the same thing with data management, that at least at one level, the sector will respond and, and say, well, look, this is sufficient, this is not sufficient, this is exemplary whatever, so that we'll have a, a broad response from the sector in terms of what people are doing um, with, with their data. And if you draw a parallel between the reporting requirements for open access publications and the final report, if you um, if there are any journal articles that uh, have failed to be made openly accessible, you can justify a reason as to why that's the case. So if uh, your data management plan went off track, um, there would be an expectation in the final report to explain why that was the case. And if the if the uh, explanation was acceptable, it's ARC would take that at face value, I, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So at this yeah. stage, I can't speak across all projects. It has to be on a um, project by project basis, but there wouldn't be um, a ramifications if there could be a, a logical and justifiable reason, reason as to why that has occurred. So we, we do look at the final reports in the ARC, and certainly, as Justin has said, we, we would look at that and look to see whether or not the reasons given are sufficient and acceptable. And I think there's an expectation uh, for grants, if there is something that goes terribly wrong uh, throughout the course of the grant, that uh, the ARC is notified. Um, it would be up to the uh, individual project manager in, to decide whether the moving off track from the data management plan was sufficient enough reason to contact the ARC and let them know throughout the process. But uh, at the very least, at the final report stage would be, would be acceptable, I think. Will the new assessor's handbook be released prior to DP DECRA submissions closing? I assume that's discovery? Yeah, yeah. and the discovery projects in the DECRA. Yeah. So the assessor handbooks at this stage are not released to the applicants or, or more widely, we do at this stage, they are given to the assessors at the time that they accept proposal to assess. So the assessor handbook and the proposal go along hand in hand. So that's that's our uh, plan at the moment. We're, and the, the assessor, as I've already said, the assessor handbook will certainly be released to the assessors, obviously. We have a technical question here. I might just go through. Uh, thanks for the discussion, he says. Well, it's a pleasure. The funding rules A1032 says the final report must address compliance with ARC open access policy as detailed at 11.5. 11.5 covers compliance with the open access policy and the obligation relating to research data and data management. Are we thinking that reporting specifically against management of data could form part of the final report in the future? Yes, so I, I think that's right. I, I might have said, I think in previous answer that, you know, I was going to answer it not from the compliance point of view, but I think as clearly pointed out by that question and, and as Justin's previous answer, um, the final report is in fact the place to, to address that, that compliance issue and to say whether or not the data has been managed as you intended and, and indeed whether or not the data is uh, going to be reused, shared, whatever, um, and there may be reasons why it's not going to be shared or reused. Um, and, and that's where the final report would need to, to address that. So someone from a historian's point of view, how do you recommend that historians working from archival sources, which are already curated in libraries and other collections, put under data management? So I suppose if I try to understand the question, they're saying they are using data that's curated by somebody else as an input into the project. Perhaps they're not doing data management on, their, on that. Or how does that apply? 
Well, I think in that case, the data is not being generated by that research mm -hmm. project. So um, I would think it would be suffice to say the data is being sourced from some other open accessible um, data source. And there are, as we continue to point out, different disciplines, specific ways in which data can be managed and treated. And if that data that's used for that research project can be linked back to the source where it is available, I think that would be sufficient. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a historian, and so my first thing to say would be go and ask a historian, what's, mm -hmm. what's the expectation in your discipline for mm -hmm. that data? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, in a sense, you've, you're making such a, that the data management plan needs to be um, really tailored to the specific discipline that it comes from. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, in one sense, that's not just an issue for historians. No. Uh, across all sorts of other areas, the government departments provide the reference data mm -hmm. from the Bureau of Meteorology or the yeah. Bureau of Statistics for Social Science. So, you, you know, I suppose you could refer to that. There's a possibility that um, there'd be some value add from a project. There might be a derived data set or something like that. And perhaps that's where the, the divide comes in. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, there are disciplines, of course, where perhaps the, the development of a, a script or a computer program or something that is analysing mm -hmm. that data, that that script or program itself becomes um, some kind of primary source mm -hmm. that might be made publicly available or not as, mm -hmm. as deemed by that discipline. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so even that might be become some of the data in one sense, which, yeah. which is made available. Mm -hmm. I think one of the you know, bigger picture principles is the fact is by making data open, it's less likely that the data will be duplicated or have to be stored somewhere else or regenerated. So it'd be, be silly to have to not make your data available and someone else does a, a very similar research uh, mm -hmm. project and could use that same data if it was made public available so, and collect the same data. So mm -hmm. we'd hate to see a, a situation where data is replicated or the same data is replicated or stored in various places. So a uh, link back to where the data source is. So another question here. Will curated data collections be counted as scholarly output for ARC and ERA purposes? Um, at this stage, it's not for ERA 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I understand there are some discussions that are occurring between the Excellence in Research for Australia side of the ARC and ANS in particular about how that may be incorporated into future ERAs, but for ERA 2015, that's not. I suppose the, the general principle there is there's an encouragement. Uh, how do we, what, what's the incentive that makes the system be self sustaining? The organisations and the individuals involved you know, feel that there's some kind of a, an incentive. And look, I think that we've a pretty good first step here, but in order to make it a sustainable system that's not based on compliance, you know, the proper reward feedback system needs to be there. Do we have room time for one more? Okay, would the ARC want to have some statement of verification and availability for reuse from data custodians where data is not generated but reused by researchers? So that's in context of the historians using digital art. That's an interesting question. I think, I think certainly the, the reuse of data, the statement about reuse may well be something that enhances the value of the project. Mm. Or, or subsequently in the value of the research feeding into future research and so on. So I think in, in a sense saying all of that may well be something that adds to the, again, to the competitiveness of this particular research proposal. I guess verification is not something that we are we mandating at all, but again, it might be in as much as saying, well, yeah, the, the person really is going to do what they say, or there are real customers out there who want to reuse the data which I'm going to generate. So again, that that might be something which plays into increasing the competitiveness of the actual application. Mm -hmm. The assessors might see that and say, yes, this is, I acknowledge this. Thank you very much for all that uh, input from the uh, e-audience. There's so many questions there. We haven't been able to cover them all, but we will catch a, capture them all and we'll make sure that you know, we'll get a copy across to the ARC so that they can think about some of the things that have been taken up and we'll certainly take them into account in our, in the ANS program as well. well. Just 10 seconds. I mean, that's a really good point that the ARC does put up the answers to frequently asked questions and we will certainly take all of the questions which you people have um, put to us today and go back and, and look at those and, and see if we need to respond further. Good. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what ANS might be doing uh, to support these changes. So we've got uh, a series of webinars and events, and this is the very first of those. Uh, there'll be an, uh, a series of these. We're thinking uh, during this grant submission period, there'll be a bit of a flurry about that 
management of data section in the application. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a flurry of this, uh, uh, you know, perhaps once every two weeks, uh, really in a, a forum. The next ones will be forums for exchanging, you know, what are you doing at your university? We'll probably get a couple of people to come in and just give a, uh, an informal uh, presentation of what they're doing and then we'll open it up for discussion. So really information sharing. We'll continue that series into the into the future as we all come to, to grips with, okay, well, for example, once you get the grant, then, then what? You know, when, when does the real serious data management start? How does a university start to take up its responsibilities, you know, providing repositories, there's you know, a whole set of things. You know, what do we do about data publication, data citation, all those other things we will continue to um, have our webinar series really targeting those kind of issues. Supporting material is the other thing that we're bringing into play here. We have a set of stuff already on the ANS website about data management, data management planning, uh, roles of a, of a university in, in the new you know, data intensive world. Uh, so help yourselves to those. We will also have a sort of a solution part to the website that we're developed that addresses the particular um, changes that are happening, happening right now around preparing these statements for grant applications. So that will be developing on the ANS website, so keep your eye on that. Uh, and we're also providing consultancies to all the research organisations around Australia, anyone who's an eligible, for an eligible institution for applying for these grants are also a key stakeholder for ANS. So we are ready to supply one-on-one -on -one advice or virtual meetings or telephone calls to anyone in the institution that um, would like to discuss or, or get further advice. So we have uh, and sort of liaison people at all universities around Australia so can start to use that uh, little network. Uh, where to start on those things, so uh, just put up a few uh, URLs. So we've got some stuff on data management, we've got particular things about the funder requirements. There's an email address at the bottom if you want to uh, contact anyone at ANS, then just use that contact at ANS. Before I get off that support, I just ask everyone not to lose the uh, the bigger picture here where we, there's a rule change here that, as we said, is really reflecting a, a societal change and a change in what we hope that research, new research can come out of this uh, new pool of data that we'll be creating from the output of research. And that really what we're trying to do in collaboration with, the organi with all the research organisations is to situate your research organisation to be able to, to make your research data more valuable so, so that it helps your collaborations, that it helps your new grant applications, that it helps the profile of the organisation as a, as a special infrastructure that you have at your university and that this is really trying to, ANS is really trying to partner with you to help make new research happen because you have more valuable data. And that's quite clear in the in the, the sort of changes to the funding rules that we're really trying to you know maximise the, the value of research through these kind of changes. So, apart from the small changes of the the application form, we really uh, hope to continue our partnership with all the research organisations in Australia to really realise the value of your research data. So we have these upcoming webinars. Uh, there's uh, have a look at our events calendar there. Um, there's all sorts of interesting things coming up. So go to this um, URL here at ans.org and there's uh, webinars uh, in this particular series will be added uh, shortly, but uh, we have an existing uh, set of things um, to support the Australian universities. Thank you very much to our um, guests today. It's been a, a great pleasure to have this discussion. Thanks to uh, Brian Yates and Justin Withers from the ARC. Thanks, thank you, Greg. Let's hope the you know the beginning of a conversation, and I think you know the ARC has shown that it's in here for the long journey uh, with research and research data, and um, that this is the the start of a of an engagement. No, I'll just thank you, um, Adrian, too. Thank you for all the support that ANS has given the ARC in discussing uh, all of this and, and the information that you have on your website. Thank you. And thanks to the audience, and thanks for the amazing uh, input from everyone uh, to the discussion. Thanks all, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.